Hi, everybody. Welcome inside the Cable 14 studios for the 2014 McMaster Marauders football preview show. And we have an esteemed panel for you here today with uh, everything you're going to need to get you set for this season. So uh, let's start over here to my left with the head coach, uh, the man entering his ninth season, Stefan Patastic. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, you've been around for a long time. We were just talking. Out. You've uh, now two years uh, going to your two years past what Greg Marshall, who was a longtime head coach of the McMaster Marauders, so you've been around for a long time. It's a good place to be. It is home and hopefully here for many more. And you've heard this voice uh, next to me here to my right, uh, Don Edwards, because he's the color play-by-play uh, -play voice of uh, the McMaster Marauders, uh, something I'm sure watching those tapes back you have to listen to, Stefan. But uh, Don Edwards here to give his two cents about what's going to happen this season. Thanks, Greg. Looking forward to it. All right. And we've also got, uh, I think this is kind of interesting, we got uh, Marshall Ferguson, and you're going to do some interviews for us as well. Yep. Uh, your fifth season uh, as uh, a quarterback with the McMaster Marauders, so uh, looking forward to seeing you on the other side of the mic in this show today. Absolutely. And the man who you replaced is uh, over here, Kyle Quinlan, uh, former quarterback, now the quarterback and receiver coach for the uh, McMaster Marauders. Uh, and uh, also you did some coaching this summer with the uh, uh, Hamilton Ironmen as well. So we'll get into that a little bit and helping uh, doing some recruiting for the team this summer as well. So we'll get into that. But uh, obviously, I think everybody wants to talk about going into this season. Uh, the biggest changes when you play uh, university football, that's one of the biggest things that you have to deal with within uh, year in year out is the fact that you have players that are graduating players that are moving on and you have to find ways to fill those holes so let's start with you coach P what are the biggest holes that you have to fill right now going into this 2014 season it's kind of the turning of the page from our, our Vanier Cup a couple years back uh, the biggest names have now all graduated uh, guys like Matt Sewell Mike DeCroce Aram Show are the last of, of championship team and so it's it's a fresh air it's a new start um, with most of those guys, Matt Sewell and, and Mike DeCroce, they were injury plagued in their senior year, so we've started to learn how to play without them. Big one, a Ram was the leader on defense and, and sorting through not having a, a Rams leadership um, is, is, our, is our challenge. Our okay. staff is up to it though. Well, he's an interesting story because uh, he was uh, going into his fourth year, I guess, but uh, he left, he wanted to, I guess, pursue his aspirations to play in the CFL and it didn't work out for him there. He's coming back and he's gonna be playing for the Hamilton Hurricanes. So it must be tough knowing that he's out there, he's available, but not available for you. Yeah, and, and a Ram is uh, a great young man. We've been privileged to work with him for three years. Uh, his uh, reality is he is a, a 20 year old with a 30 year old's problems and life challenges and um, the cost of going to school and, and being at McMaster one more was, was too high. He took a shot at the, the CFL and, and was very close. I think an injury might have hampered his ability to play pro this year. Um, and so uh, for him to work and support his family and, and still get his football fix, uh, we hope to see him throughout the fall. All right, let's go over to the man that uh, watches most of these games uh, from up in the booth, uh, Don Edwards. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that you uh, think are going to be challenges for this team going into this season. Well, I, I think that in any university and academic setting, one of the challenges is natural and inherent, and that's, as Coach P already identified, graduation. You got guys like, and, and these guys aren't just, you know, getting a degree and moving on. Sewell got a couple of degrees, did he not, and was involved in a number of programs. So you lose a lot of guys every year through natural attrition. The key to that natural attrition is having guys in the pipeline. And over the last couple of years, when Matt has had injury problems, you've had younger guys who've had to step in. That's a double-edged sword. On one side of the equation, you hate to lose a quality player like Matt Sewell. The other side of the equation, you're going in this year with a guy who's probably got lots of reps against first level CIS competition last year who is not a true rookie to start really he's got that experience so you know those are the natural things that are going to happen in a university environment you have to celebrate that it, you, while, while I'm sure coach Riley in particular is going to miss him at Sewell he's thrilled to have him playing in the CFL as they were with guys like Kyle Koch when he left like Ryan Donnelly when he left and you know I don't talk about quarterbacks because I don't know anything about that part of the game I'm an old line guy but it, it is the nature of the program the nature of university sport that these guys move on and the quality of the program is measured in the guys they have coming in to replace them and I think one of the hallmarks of the Stefan Patasic era at McMaster, which I can't, still cannot believe has been nine years this year, Coach, yeah. is the quality of people that have come along and stepped in and are able to contribute 
the minute they get on the football field. Well, I have to think one position that's pretty tough to uh, replace is quarterback. Fortunately, that's not something that you necessarily have to do this year because you have your fifth-year man coming back uh, in Marshall Ferguson. Now, Marshall, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, what changes for you this year. I mean, obviously, when you get some of these young guys coming in, I know you had uh, um, uh, some luck uh, with uh, Van der Voort uh, yesterday. Did I say that right? Uh, uh, Daniel yeah. Van der say it. Vandervoort, is it? Vandervoort, yeah. I said it right. I mean, I, I always uh, that's a tough one to say. Look at the spelling on that one. It's tough. But uh, yeah, he was the 2013 CIS Rookie of the Year last year. Uh, so you came and you had a pretty good receiver in him, a, a, a good target to throw to. You'll have him back this year. But there are some new faces that you're probably going to have to get used to this year. Yeah, I think Danny's explosive ability is pretty easy for anybody that watches Mac football and OUA football at large to see. He's a guy who um, jumped off the page every time that you watch one of our games. and. Uh, there's a lot of guys that we've been able to recruit that have come in this year that have that same kind of explosive ability to, to change a game in one play. So I'm hoping that uh, those guys that, that have come in this year, um, they've through training camp, they've adapted really well to our systems and to the way that we operate. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with them and, and trying to create some big plays. And you're also thinking about uh, your future beyond football already. Yes. Going uh, into your fifth year here, I know you got a lot to think about with the season. Yep. But you're thinking about what's going to happen after football. And I think one of the things you were talking about was moving to the other side of the mic. Yes. You've been interviewed so many times throughout your career, but now you want to do the interviewing. Yep. So that's something that uh, you've been working with us on in the preseason, talking to some of your players. So uh, it's interesting we get a chance to actually see Marshall Ferguson talk to some of the um, some of the coaches, some of the other players. We're going to start with your offensive coordinator John Behe a guy that obviously you work with uh, on a regular basis and now you I'm sure he's interviewed you many times or he's had many yeah, pep talks with you asking questions of me of why did you do this so and why did you do that him, why are you <laughs> now you get doing? to question him <laughs> so let's take a look at uh, Marshall Ferguson's interview with John Behe what kind of evolution have you seen in the football team in, in your time here and specifically the offensive side of the ball well, I think the number one thing uh, for any coach um, on offense specifically is you can't, you can't force home your system. You need to tailor it around your personnel. So as you know, we've had uh, our personnel cycle through, uh, we've had a couple of different cycles of kids, we've got to build our offense around that. So um, you know, when we've had you know, mobile quarterbacks versus less mobile quarterbacks, you know, we can run a little bit more zone read type stuff and move the pocket. Uh, you know, a big old line, strong old line versus maybe uh, not so much. So, um, specifically over the years, you know, we've we've been fairly pass heavy, and um, you know, I think in Canadian game you have to be. But um, you know, having a, a big old line this year, or maybe a little bit more emphasis on coming together in the run game, and being able to work the run and the pass together, obviously extremely key as well in the Canadian game. Our running game is, is pretty solid across the board. Like you say, some bigger guys up front, depth at running back. What do you look forward to most working in the run game? Well, I just want to see I want to see us be able to have some success on first down in the run game more than anything and put us in good situations to open up the playbook on second down. If we get six or more on first down, you know, we're doing some good things. And you know, we've got some like we said, we've got some big old linemen, but I'm excited to see our tailbacks. Um, you know, get some success uh, with Wayne Moore, uh, Kayshawn Davis, and Kingsley Amankel. We've got a pretty good three-headed uh, monster there that we can lean on, and I want those guys to have some success. And I think that what's unique about their group is they want each other to succeed as well. The uh, variety of running backs that we have, like you talk about some of the names, Kingsley, Wayne, uh, Isaiah getting out of the backfield a little bit, doing some different things. What advantage do you think having a very multiple group like that gives the offense and you specifically as a coordinator? Well, first and foremost, I think the more sh shares that or carries that you can share amongst your group throughout the season keeps them fresh comes come playoff time. You know, less wear and tear, less grinding on their bodies, etc. But the more versatile we can be, the more that we can put stress on a defense by releasing guys out of the backfield or running, you know, power up the middle or, you know, toss outside. They each are a little unique with their strengths and weaknesses, and it's up to us as a staff to kind of tailor make our offense in what run plays and pass plays we want them in the game for versus, you know, the others. So um, I think we're off to a good start, and so far, you know, our backs have, have done a great job.
I'm not sure John B. He's ever faced such a well-versed and educated set of questions coming from his quarterback. So uh, that was a great job you did on that. Uh, how, how was it being on this side of the mic? It's fun. It's uh, something I realized I wanted to do a couple of years ago, and uh, getting to talk to people that I work with every day very closely is always interesting because you get to uh, kind of explore the, the possibilities of, of what we're trying to accomplish every day in front of a camera, which is a little bit different than behind closed doors. So it was fun talking to John and uh, the rest of the guys that I got to talk to through this preview show. Well, I think something that's going to be fun is talking to Kyle Quinlan. Let's get a critique on, uh, on that interview, Kyle. What did you think watching the guy that replaced you at quarterback, the guy that you helped bring up into this league, and uh, the guy that was your offensive coordinator when you were with Mac? What did you think of that? I think he looks natural. He looks natural. He's always been a guy that, uh, you know, is really easy spoken. And I've, I've sat in the booth when he does the radio shows and stuff like that. So um, it's been a lot of fun. I think he's doing a great job. Is he a better quarterback or a better uh, broadcaster? I think he's pretty close. Pretty, pretty close. close. <laughs> All right. It's a tough one. It's a toss up. Hey, Kyle, let's talk to you a little bit about uh, the offense going into this year. Obviously, as a quarterback's coach, it's good to have a fifth year uh, experienced guy coming in. Um, but you also have a, a, some new recruits coming in. And uh, one of the players that's coming in that uh, we'll be talking a little bit, and I know that uh, Marshall did an interview with him, is Asher Hastings. He's a guy that's got a little bit of CIS experience coming over from Regina, uh, but a guy that's new to the OUA. Yeah, definitely. We're uh, we're excited about Asher. You know, we went after him pretty hard, knowing that Marshall's going into his last year and to to provide some depth behind. Um, a couple of our first year uh, quarterbacks from last year didn't return, so to have a guy of his caliber come in and a guy that's ready to play, you know, right away is is pretty exciting. And um, obviously, like I said, going into Marshall's last year, um, we're excited to watch him and see what he can do on offense, and then um, that gives us some nice depth behind him. You know, I, I know uh, you've had the situation uh, with Kyle when you had a fifth-year guy that was on the way out, and then you had a guy like Marshall coming in, and now you've got uh, Asher uh, sitting in the wings waiting. Uh, do you, do, I mean, does, how do you work him in? How do you get him that experience he needs in this league to be ready to go next season? I think training camp to start, uh, we uh, we let the three guys compete. Uh, Darius, our, our, our other quarterback, is real close as well. All three young men got equal throws over the last nine days and um, they're competing for a starting role and, and once that role is defined we got to invest each week to get one guy ready and, and week one uh, Marshall's going to be the guy to get ready. Um, if, if throughout our OUA season every year we've had some opportunities uh, to get uh, our number two guy some meaningful throws and keep him sharp. Uh, injury and stuff and bumps in the road that we've had at quarterback we've handled very very well because we're uh, we're investing in all three all the time um, and in fact uh, whoever ends up throwing our show teams for Coach Knox on defense probably gets the best reps because they're going against uh, I think the best secondary in the country. Um, bottom line is all three young men we have complete confidence in. They know our offense and if we need them this year we, we're not going to hesitate to use them. All right, we're going to get to uh, your two quarter or two of your three quarterbacks going one on one in an interview with Marshall talking to Asher. We'll get to that in just a minute. Let's talk about what's happening uh, coming next week on uh, Labor Day. You play your uh, season opener uh, at home against the Guelph Griffins, a team that had a very good record last year, uh, a seven and one team, a team that finished uh, third in the conference, and that's again uh, 1 p.m. on Labor Day. That's a game that you can watch on cable 14 as well. It's McMaster hosting the Guelph Griffins, and obviously as you. Can can see uh, the schedule maybe gets a little easier after Guelph but a tough start uh, against a team uh, that's pretty good so let's talk about that game let's talk about what you expect from the Guelph Griffins in your season opener and how you've been preparing for this team. I, we were treating it like a playoff game you've mentioned the 7-1 and record and, and uh, it is one of the OUA's finest um, we're really pleased to have them at home we need the 13th man to be uh, present in the stands and, and we lost a, a nail biter there last year uh, missed a two-point convert on the last play of the game to tie it and uh, the home field we think will swing it uh, we're looking forward to playing them in a, a bright sunny filled Joyce Stadium um, the implications in Ontario if you don't get top two in our league uh, you don't get a bye and the playoff run is a lot harder uh, this game has huge playoff implications and it's all hands on deck. This is a playoff game as far as we're concerned. Game one, you're already thinking about the playoffs. You're already thinking about the teams that you might have to face in the playoffs. And obviously the Guelph Griffins are a team that, uh, again, will obviously have a pretty good program. Uh, are there any big changes that you've noticed in that team from this year to last? 
Uh, there's maybe some turnover in their D-line, which was one of the strengths of their football team, so we'll see how they, they, that affects them. They've had some big transfers, and uh, their recruiting process is very sound, so they've always had some young talent coming in each of the last couple years, and they, too, have a fifth-year quarterback that we got to contain because we won't stop him completely, and uh, he's not as much of a packet, pocket passer as my friend over here. He, he moves around, and, and we got to keep him in front of us and keep our mistakes in front of us, and we got a chance. Hey Don, I know you know that schedule inside and out. You've been studying it, uh, trying to figure out what games are going to be the important games, the games to watch for. Obviously, that game against Guelph will be an important one, but take us through the schedule and tell us what you think are some of the games that we are going to be key to this team. Well, I would say, uh, to be sure, that game against Jazz Lindsay and the Guelph Griffins on Monday is vital, and as Coach Patasic's already identified, only the top two clubs get a bye, which makes your road to the national championship Less challenging, not easy, but less challenging. And there are no doormat teams in the in the OUA anymore. There are teams. I mean, we used to speak about Guelph in that, those terms four years ago, five years ago. Now they are far from there. They finished seven and one last year. They had a great season in 2012. So, the challenge I would say for our viewers is to. Make sure you're catching the games. If you can't be at Ron Joyce, watch them on Cable 14. Even if you go to Ron Joyce, watch them rehashed on Cable 14. We talk about Carlton, and you would think of Carlton as really only the second year of their program since they returned to the OUA. But this is not like an expansion team in the CFL or the NFL. There is a lot of talent on that team, a lot of local talent. Kyle, whose last name I could never pronounce from Delhi, who was an outstanding quarterback, uh, outstanding quarterback with the Ironmen, and then went there as a slot back and played for Team Ontario. Uh, University of Waterloo has had its fair share of challenges, but consistency is what brings programs around. Marshall Bingaman has been involved in that program forever and is now finally the head coach, so that ship is righted itself. Uh, there are no doormat teams. There are, there are no weeks where they can say, okay, well, let's put Don Edwards in a quarterback because this one's a walk. Because it, it, it just doesn't happen anymore in the OUA. The competition is too good. There are no, and, and frankly, the hotbed of that recruiting is probably the Golden Horseshoe area. All right, well, let's talk about, you, you talk about how great some of these teams are in the OUA, and defense obviously is important. And I know that uh, this year you got a man back uh, that's going to help out with defense. I'm talking about Greg Knox, your defensive coordinator is coming back. Uh, you had him uh, a couple of years ago. You didn't have him last year. What does it mean to have him back now? Uh, with Coach Knox, you instantly get a coordinator that has been part of the recruiting and the development of every single student athlete in my program. Uh, he knows everybody uh, from staff to support people in the in the athletic complex, and and it just it just so many synergies there that uh, Kevin Ivan did a wonderful job, but breaking him in and getting him up to speed on all those little things takes time. Um, and so I thought Kevin did a wonderful job. I thought Kevin educated us on some unique defenses and some unique CFL philosophies. Um, those learnings have been retained under Coach Knox's leadership, and and. Greg, amongst all his strengths, one of the best is engaging his defensive staff and watching all those guys work together. Uh, I think the chemistry on that defense is as good as it's ever been, and I cannot wait to see them go. Well, we saw how Marshall handed it, uh, handled an interview with uh, the offensive coordinator. That was easy. You're an offensive guy. Yeah. Let's see how he does in an interview with the defensive coordinator, Greg Knox. Here it is. Typically in the film room, you're tough on the guys, uh, and we've talked about this before, about uh, how you like to toughen them up over time in order to get the best out of them long term and, and they'll either figure it out that they were, you were trying to push them as hard as you could and, and make them a better player or they just won't understand the process, right? And having you back in the film room talking to the guys already, despite the tough coaching, they love your style and they enjoy having you back. Is that something that pulled you back to Mac was understanding that these are guys that want to be coached and want to get better? Yeah, I mean, it's, you, you build relationships with young men and you, you watch them grow and, you, you know, the, their hard work dictates, you know, the, the, the level of success they attain. But, I mean, to be part of that process uh, is, is fun for me. It's something I, I look forward to and, and re-engaging the kids that I'd, I'd worked with for a number of years. So, uh, you know, in terms of their, in terms of their development, um, you know, they may or may not like me when I'm here, but I, I'd, I'd like to think when they when they get a little bit older and mature, uh, they're going to look back on the experience and, and realize that uh, everything we do here is for their best interest. And you, uh, you are an exceptional recruiter. I'll admit that. I've talked to a lot of people that understand the effort and the time that you put into recruiting 
uh, the very best athletes across the province and beyond to get them here. What are you most proud of in the in the crop that you brought in this year? Not necessarily a specific player, but maybe um, a couple of guys that you're really glad that are here and that you think can really uh, grow their football ability in the McMaster football program. Well, I think you know, not really arriving on the scene till, till very late in the the recruiting season, uh, there was a, a bit of a, a last minute uh, burst, the, you know, of, of uh, high quality kids that uh, that, that committed. Um, some kids on the defense, specifically like Steve McNichol and Hassan Berry, I think, uh, are going to uh, are going to be able to contribute uh, early and often in their career. Uh, obviously, on the offensive side of the ball, uh, with, with names like Hastings and Peterman, yeah. and et cetera, uh, all top quality, all top quality prospects. So I think on the balance, the recruiting class uh, of 2014 for McMaster was was strong and, and we're seeing the fruits of that labor uh, on the field out here in camp. Marshall, uh, interesting hearing you talking to Coach Knox about recruiting and uh, some of the recruiting that the team has done and how great a recruiter he is. Well, uh, Stefan, I should ask you about the 29 recruits that you guys have coming into camp this year. A third of those are local guys, and that's kind of uh, something that you've done throughout the years. You brought in a local guy, a lot of local guys. You look at the roster, and you'll see a lot of Hamilton or Hamilton area guys. Uh, how important is it to recruit here in your own backyard? As Don mentions, the, the bulk of recruiting for most CIS schools is Southern Ontario. It's uh, uh, some of the best developmental football in the world um, and just the population base in our country. It's the core uh, the core base that we all have to get our rosters. Uh, so being in Hamilton and keeping our Hamiltonians at home uh, is how we built a Vanier Cup. I, I have a conspiracy theory that the uh, U.S. housing market crash and the recession um, and the economics that that creates kept more Hamiltonians in Hamilton and helped build that 2011 team. So uh, <laughs> it, it is it is key to keep these kids at home. It's a world-class education right in their own backyard. Uh, so getting to know the Marauder football family and, and have them uh, make an educated decision about the university that's really close uh, is something that we spend a lot of time in our recruiting efforts. Yeah, and it's important to have guys out there watching these players, uh, getting a first-hand look at what some of these young, talented players in Hamilton are doing, and having your quarterback and receivers coach out coaching uh, one of the local teams, the Hamilton Ironmen. Uh, that's uh, that's first-hand right there. He's getting to know some of these guys really well. Uh, Kyle, talk a little bit about coaching the Hamilton Ironmen this summer. Yeah, it was my first uh, my first head coaching experience. So we went 0 and 8, and it wasn't uh, <laughs> wasn't what you would wish I guess in your first year but um, certainly had a blast with it. Um, I, the one unfortunate thing I got to work with a lot of the guys that I played with at McMaster you know Matt Pericini, Rob Babick, uh, Mike Warner, a bunch of those guys that are also trying to make it a transition in the coaching world. Um, so we had a lot of fun we learned a lot as a staff and uh, certainly being able to see the talent out there um, this is an incredibly rich area for talent like, like coach mentioned so um, I'm looking forward to, to working a little bit closer with Rob Underhill and the Hurricanes and trying to smooth over, over some things there and I think definitely in the long run that'll help our program here. Are you in contact with Coach Potasic uh, throughout the uh, summer talking about some of these guys that you're seeing whether it be guys on your roster or guys that you're playing against? Oh yeah definitely I mean uh, luckily uh, the, the Ironmen play in the OVFL and I think that's one of the, the toughest leagues in the, in the province and um, every single week you're coming against some incredible players uh, really really talent rich uh, league so definitely we talked to coach and we talked to coach Knox and um, try to coordinate and see and, and uh, make sure we're getting that information back to the top. Now let me ask you this because you spent a lot of time with coach Potasic uh, as his quarterback uh, him as your coach uh, your coaching style now how much does uh, that resemble that of coach Potasic or how, what have you learned from coach P? Well, I don't have enough time to talk about all the things I learned from this guy, but uh, Good, definitely, yeah, the, <laughs> definitely the definitely uh, the positivity. That's a big thing. I, I I didn't want in the recruiting process. I didn't want to play for a coach that was a real negative guy. Um, so that's one thing that coach Coach Batasic is highly praised for, and it's it's very deserving. So um, I've definitely tried to take that into my own style. Just be positive with the guys. I think uh, in my own experience, you want to play for a guy that uh, you care about and cares about you, rather than a guy you're just purely motivated out of fear for. Um, so that's, I think that's probably the biggest lesson I've taken. 
Well, I, I know a lot of the players would share that sentiment. Uh, now, going into this season, obviously, you've been, when it's such a short season uh, as a coach, do you have to look ahead to games or can you focus on one game at a time? I know, uh, look, you, you look at the second half, the first half of the schedule, you got that tough game against Guelph. And I know, Don, you said you can't take any of these teams easy. No. But then you look to the second half and you see some of those tougher teams rolling in. Uh, how do you approach that? It, uh, in theory, you're supposed to go one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. I have to laugh on the car ride over. Marshall's like, who do we even play week two? I don't know. And so having a good opponent week one makes that easy right now. And, and we have to get through this first game. Um, and in Ontario, the challenge is uh, I think there's lots of teams that, that have the talent to compete for a Yates Cup. Uh, but you have to use this time, this short season, to get that talent ready for those playoffs. And so you can't look forward and take weeks off. The, day, the task at hand is the most important thing. The game at hand is the most important thing. If you do not get better week in and week out, you will run out of time and you will not walk away with the Yates Cup. Okay, so Marshall, let me just tell you, week two, it's Waterloo. Not, yeah, it's that, okay, that, not that you're thinking about that down. right now, yeah. but uh, let me ask you about uh, getting ready, ready. I mean, uh, you got two weeks in training camp. Uh, is it a whirlwind the first two weeks getting ready for that first game? I wouldn't say it's easy for me, but definitely being a senior, it makes things more in line. You understand the process of training camp and uh, what days we're installing and what days we have to go hard and what days we maybe peel back a bit and save our legs and get mentally ready. And So I understand the process of a training camp better now than I think I ever have, especially after starting last year for the first time. Uh, but the younger guys, I think there's definitely a little bit of a period where they have to, to figure out the process and um, figure out which days they need to really be locked in and, and focused and other days where they maybe need to you know, get up to the weight room or they need to uh, make sure that they're registered fully as a student. Now, there's all these different things that happen through camp that uh, are in and out of the football field that I think everybody attacks differently, but it is definitely a process that each person attacks differently. Okay, let me ask you real quickly, uh, getting ready for week one against the Griffins, what kinds of things are you focusing on? All I can think about is the two-point conversion against them last year that we, we weren't able to tie up, so that's... Does that eat at your crotch? Oh, yeah, do that's, I probably watched that a, a couple hundred times, and that's an old cliche where, you know, you stare at the play that lost you the game or didn't win you the game, but there's the reality of it is that was a major point in our season where we could have really changed the direction and maybe our playoff seating and our matchups and so on and so forth, but... So um, you have something to prove going into this game. Yeah, like Coach P's talking about it being a playoff game. I think that's a perfect analogy because I see it as a game that, you know, you never say week one's a, a must win, but the reality is in the OUA that it kind of is, especially against an opponent like this. So preparing for them X's and O's wise, there's a lot of different things that we'll look at and, and we'll look at film from last year and take a lot of things into consideration, but it's definitely something that I want to I wanna change the outcome from last year. Well, we talked about uh, some of the new recruits coming in. Uh, one of the guys that's returning, a guy that uh, had some injury problems last year is Joey Capito. Uh, you had a chance to sit down and talk Easiest to him. Easiest interview on the team. Easiest Absolutely. interview on the team. A guy that <laughs> loves to talk. I've interviewed him before. Yes. And uh, a guy that's looking to come back and have a healthy season. So let's see this interview. Um, all right, so last season, uh, coming back, being a senior, a leader on the defense, you were injured for, for a large majority of the season. What was the disappointment in, in trying to come back for a senior season to be a leader and not being able to uh, show it on the field the way you wanted to? Um, I don't know if that, it was just disappointment, but it helped me mature as a player and as an individual. You know, there's a lot of young talent out there, and you've obviously seen it on both sides of the ball. Yeah. So I think more for me, I, I got an opportunity to really study film and prepare mentally and be a smarter football player, and I think I've been able to carry that over this year and help the younger guys out a little bit as well as myself. I know personally, as I've gotten older in this offense, I think the mental side of it, the understanding of what we're trying to accomplish is, is probably the biggest difference. Is that what you see as well on defense, understanding the big picture? Yeah, I would agree 100%. Like when I came in, it was just go and play. I didn't really understand why I was doing it, but now I get it, right? When you guys run a cut game, I understand what your goal is, where I have to be to kind of take away both routes. Yeah. So it just, your game evolves as you grow mentally. And the fun back and forth between you and I every day is <laughs> when you're playing on the, uh, the outside there, I'm reading you all the time and you have an understanding of what I'm trying to do and I understand what you're trying to do. So sometimes we just get in a game of Jeopardy where we're going back and forth trying to guess what each other are thinking. Do you enjoy the, the back and forth it's, thought it's process? It's really like a chess match, right? Yeah. You gotta anticipate the next move. And with a guy like yourself, you've been here five years now, I mean, 
you've seen everything, you know everything, you know what we're doing, I know what you're doing, so yeah. it is a lot of fun for me, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a mind game, it's always fun. The, uh, having Coach Knox back on defense, is that a bit of a, a comfort factor for you? Is we're it just really fun to have he's him back? back? He's, he's the man, I don't know how else to describe him. Uh, nobody puts more effort and more time in the CAS than he does. He gets everybody ready to play, and from a personal standpoint, I see a lot of my, himself and me. Right. I mean, he was a CFL all-star for, for tons of years, and he's a very cerebral player, very intelligent, and I try to model my game kind of after that as well. Wow, he sees a lot of himself in uh, Coach Knox. So, so maybe uh, Joey Capito will be a great coach one day. But uh, let's talk about uh, Don having a guy like that come back into the lineup after missing so much time last year. And even when he was in the lineup, he probably wasn't 100% last year. So you get a guy that's a veteran, a guy with that kind of speed, a guy with that kind of skill back in the lineup. Uh, what kind of boost do you expect him to add? Well, I would think that there is no better leadership than what a Joe Caputo can bring to the other guys that play secondary positions. Uh, young guys coming in can see what this kid's endured and yet he's back there, he's got a smile on his face, he's uh, working on becoming the man. He, <laughs> but he works hard day in and day out and so they understand the price that they will have to pay to have the kind of success that Joe Caputo has had on the football field and in the, hopefully in the classroom. So. I think that, you know, as a shining example, you can talk about here's what we got to do and here's how we got to do it and so on. But a guy like Joe Caputo, a guy like uh, Pizzetta, who's coming back after two major knee problems in two successive years, those are examples. You can't buy that kind of stuff. Having guys like that who've more than paid the price and who are out there working as hard as everybody else and harder in most cases sets a tremendous example for the younger players to follow and speaks to the quality of those kids. Marshall, what kind of guy is uh, Joey in the locker room? In the locker room, he's uh, he's brash, he's entertaining, <laughs> he, he brings the noise on the field, he likes to talk a lot, and, and from a quarterback perspective, you know, he he chops the field in half a lot of the time for us because there's those lockdown guys in the NFL. You talk about Revis and Brandon Browner and um, and Richard Sherman. They kind of, as a corner, they can change the game across the field. So like Don's talking about, he has the ability to really change a, an offensive uh, perspective on, on an entire defense and how to attack it. And he's definitely one of the leaders. Yeah, he is. He is. And he, he doesn't put the music on ever, but we don't allow him to. But he is, uh, he's a good talker. He's a good guy to talk to. Well, he doesn't put the music on? Is no, that he's a, not allowed. He's got a weird music taste. If you don't like his music no. taste, you want to get into that. Yeah. But uh, Coach P, talk about having a guy like that, a guy that's uh, uh, larger than life in the locker room, a guy that uh, you know is so in tune with the game, a guy that works so hard and, and can set that example for the rest of your team. What's it like having a Joey Capito in the locker room? You know, he is... Uh, he is brash and love it, and he is confident, uh, but his confidence never interrupts his ability to learn and process and get better. Uh, he is one of the biggest playmakers we've ever had. Uh, I think he might be the only DB in the history of the CIS that in his 12 playoff games, he has like 14 interceptions. He averages more than one interception a playoff game, which is, he's crazy good. And so uh, that confidence that and that lack of fear at that specific position is is mandatory and unique I hope it rubs off on some of my young guys in moderation obviously that's going to be a strength on the uh, on the defense talk about some of the other uh, strengths on that side of the ball I think that back end that secondary is uh, last two of the last three years they've led the nation in interceptions uh, I, there's no reason to think they're not going to be every bit as good with all those fifth-year kids back that uh, that gives our defensive coordinator lots of flexibility. He can leave them hung out to dry and blitz and send six, seven man pressures because the five kids back there are smart and they've seen a lot of uh, big games and big wars and, and they, they're gonna make plays from start to finish. And so uh, we can be as dynamic a defense as there is in the country uh, and those back ends will make Coach Knight right more times than wrong when he, when he takes a chance. All right, no, no disrespect here, Marshall, but is defense your strength on this team this year? I, I think it's the group that's going to have to set the tone. I, I think it's the most senior and the most ready to play this year, and so they need to have a, a fast start. I think our special teams and our offense have loads of talent, um, and they need the defense to toe the line while we get up to speed and get all our young kids um, as game ready as, as that defense should be week one.
All right, let's go through the schedule game by game. And I know, Marshall, this will be educational yeah, for you because uh, past this week, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> so we start with this game uh, one against the Guelph Griffins happening on Labor Day. Uh, that's Monday, September the 1st, a game you can watch on cable 14. It's uh, 1 p.m. Uh, at uh, Ron Joyce Stadium. Uh, obviously, you expect the big crowd there. You expect to have the crowd on your side, and you're hoping that's going to be an advantage for the team this year uh, as opposed to last year when you lost on their turf. Indeed. It, uh, apparently there's, I think, less than 500 seats left. Uh, the Frosh come. Our first year students uh, are, are going to be in the crowd. Um, we're expecting it, it to be sold out. Uh, Guelph 7-1 and one and, and a, a playoff contender and, and maybe a top 10 in the nation. And so it doesn't get any bigger than that. And it's a great way to start. Uh, we've had a great training camp and we're now, we have four days to get ready for that game. We'll be ready. All right, so week two, Waterloo. You guys travel uh, to uh, Waterloo to take on the Warriors. That's uh, Saturday, September the 6th at 1 p.m. And then uh, uh, that you've, the following week, you guys return home on Saturday, uh, September uh, the 13th to take on Carlton. That's at 1 p.m. Then it's back on the road. You guys are at home on the road, home on the road for this uh, this schedule. But uh, you're back at home. Or sorry, you're back out on the road on uh, Saturday, September 27th. Uh, another 1 p.m. start. Of course, all of your home games are on cable 14. So you can watch all of those games here on cable 14. Uh, you're back home uh, to uh, Queens on Saturday, September 1st. And then a big one for you guys. I know it's a big rivalry on Saturday, October the 4th. You guys head to London where you'll take on the Western Mustangs. And obviously that's one of those games that you have to circle on the schedule. Are there games that you circle on the schedule or am I just? Uh, no, absolutely there are. Uh, certainly uh, the Guelph game was is the first circle and, and then if you do sneak a peek you, you do tend to look for that Western game and see when you got them where you got them and, and I think we're their homecoming this year and, and um, one of my favorite memories in the, my nine years is uh, uh, a young Marauder team that was supposed to get destroyed by a number two in the nation Western Mustang team in in 09 and, and Mr. Quinlan threw for three touchdowns ran for three and we beat him 42-35 with Mike Folds at the helm in their homecoming and believe me when I tell you there is no sound better than 9,000 homecoming Western fans with nothing to say. When you can remember a game with that kind of detail, obviously it, it's left an impact. Uh, why is why is homecoming, uh, why is beating a team in their homecoming such a big deal? I mean, is that a game that they expect to win? When you guys play your homecoming game, do you expect to win that game? You do tend to see universities pick opponents uh, on homecoming when all their uh, alumni are back that they're likely to have success in. And so uh, if, if we're chosen, that's an insult as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and certainly, uh, certain institutions market uh, with a, a, an air of elitism, and, and uh, I think Western sees themselves as pretty good, and so bringing them some humility is always something that we're happy to do and look forward to trying to do at, uh, at the end of uh, a six-game tough streak for us before we get into bye. What week do you guys play your homecoming? I believe that is the Carlton week. That's the Carlton week. It's Queens? Queens. Is it? Okay. Okay, so that's the week before. So you play your homecoming, and then uh, the next week you guys go out on the road and play uh, the homecoming game against Western. So that'll be interesting. Uh, Don, talk a little bit about that game against uh, what, the Western Mustangs. How, well, I mean, <coughs> it, there's a, a, a philosophy, I think, throughout the OUA that um, my favorite team is Mac and whoever is playing Western. I, and I think that, you know, if you go to Guelph, your favorite team is Guelph and whoever is playing Western. I think that theory, that philosophy permeates throughout the entire OUA. So um, I'm going to London to watch that, to be sure. And I am not an alum of either institution, but I'm going there and I'll be wearing my garnet and gray, or maroon and gray, and I'll be rooting for the, uh, for the Marauders. All of them are <clears throat> going to be outstanding events, great games. Um, I would encourage everybody to come to every game you can and go to the road games that you can go to. Sustainably, the best football program in this area for a long time now has been the McMaster Marauders. And the caliber of football is as good at Ron Joyce Stadium as it is no matter who's playing at Ron Joyce Stadium. This is a really good football program. It's a really good football team with great kids in it who become great citizens. And every time they're on the field, I want to root for them. 
All right, let's go through just the last couple of games on that schedule. If we could bring that graphic back up. Uh, they, after that game against uh, the Western Mustangs, it's uh, Laurier uh, here at Ron Joyce Stadium. And then you guys are uh, back out on the road to finish off the season. Uh, and uh, that's Saturday, October 25th at 1 p.m. You guys expect to be around 7-0 going into that game, I would imagine. Uh, that's, the, that's the plan going into the season. Uh, is it weird, uh, Marshall, looking at the schedule this uh, far in advance? Is it weird for you to think about those games? I don't have any time to break it down. No, there's, uh, there's a lot of different aspects in an OEA season that you look forward to. And uh, like you talk about circling games, I've, you know, I remember watching Kyle play homecoming at Western uh, in 2009. I was watching it on TV that afternoon back home in Kingston. So um, that kind of paints the picture for me of what that environment will look like. And he kind of laid down the blueprint of what you need to do to, to get that win and get out of there celebrating. So. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting parts of that schedule that I look forward to being a part of. Will this be your first homecoming against Western? Uh, yes, it'll be my first at them. I don't believe they've ever scheduled us on their homecoming. I don't know how many homecomings we've played since I've been around, but yeah, it'll be my first one there, so it'll be, uh, it'll be a packed house, I'm sure. Well, talk about going into this uh, final season, a part of the McMaster family for five years. Uh, do, you, do you think about that? Do you think, wow, I mean, this will be my last homecoming game with the McMaster Marauders the week before that game uh, on, against the the Western Mus uh, yeah the Mustangs uh, do you think about those things do you, like you the, the, you've got eight games left yeah. uh, eight games left as a, as a starting quarterback with the McMaster Marauders we were celebrating yesterday it was the last day of training camp ever <laughs> last day of training I mean, camp ever but you but in some ways you got to miss it oh yeah 100 percent there's you know I had a long long off season to prepare and train and think about my last year and what I wanted to change and um, different ways I wanted to approach leadership and you know my on-field mechanics and all of these different things that quarterbacking kind of entails so um, and definitely one of those things that I thought about was you know the my last homecoming is definitely one because we get to see all of the people from the, the football family come back and that's always been special for me whether I knew who they were in my first and second year or not you saw faces around that were unbelievably happy to be back in in our locker room and watching our games and seeing us play and um, that's something that'll always stick out for me and there's I'm sure there's going to be a lot of those moments kind of like what Derek Jeter's going through right now with the Yankees there's going to be those moments through the season that you realize it's your last this last that and it'll be uh, Kyle went through it and I'm sure he'll uh, he'll have some sympathy for me as I go through it and we'll, we'll talk it through. Yeah, well, Kyle, you've been there. You've done this. You had your uh, your fifth year, uh, and it was a good year uh, with uh, the McMaster Marauders. What kind of emotions can uh, Marshall expect going through the season? Well, it's a roller coaster ride for sure. You know, you you appreciate the little things, like you said, talking about uh, the last training camp. You know, um, do you miss I've, training camp? I do. I do. Actually, I've been with only three quarterbacks in camp. I've been throwing quite a bit, so I'm having some fun with it this year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, definitely, it's, he's, he's going to have a blast with it in his last year. It's your, your last kind of joy ride and uh, make, make memories that will last forever. Well, talk about uh, your last homecoming uh, at McMaster. I mean, obviously, you're still a part of the team. You're still a part of the community, and, and, and you're experiencing it in a different way, I guess you could say. But as a quarterback, as a starting quarterback, what was it like playing that last homecoming? Yeah, no, it's a great experience, you know, to see, as, as Marsh member, uh, mentioned earlier, to, to bring back your former teammates from all the years, the guys that have kind of laid the groundwork uh, before you. It's, it's great to see those guys and to, to see them watch you um, play in the, an environment that they helped grow. So especially with us in my last two years, we went back to back Vanier. So a lot of those guys to see them and be proud of, of what they helped accomplish, uh, that's, a, that's a great feeling. All right, let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned the three quarterbacks. Asher Hastings is one of the guys that's coming in. Uh, what, have, what have you noticed from this guy? I mean, obviously you've been on the field with him quite a bit in training camp. What have you noticed from him? What are some of his tendencies that we can expect uh, uh, so far? Well, he's, he's very similar to Marsh in the fact that he's uh, you know, a pocket passer. He's going to sit in there and, and uh, find the check downs and find the reads. And um, we've got to understand that he plays a very high, high caliber of football out there. He came from out west. They won the national championship last year. Um, he won their equivalent of the Heck Crate and uh, the Wally Buono Award, I believe it's called. Very prestigious award. So um, he's coming in with a great resume and um, right now just getting up to speed within our offense and um, has shown flashes of, of brilliance and, and still some times where he's got to catch up. Seven, does he approach you about coming to play for this program or do you approach him in the offseason? Asher sent out a, an email to all of us and, and those that actually got through the film and, and looked at it went, oh my goodness. And, and so uh, 
Uh, we uh, got back to him, uh, had him come into Hamilton to see the campus. Uh, I think he saw a home basketball game and got a, a sense of the culture and uh, met Kyle. He was a huge Quinlan fan and, and raved about that Vanier Cup and uh, I think his dream is to, to someday be in a similar situation that, that he watched Kyle in and, and so Kyle was very involved in the process and um, just introducing him to our competitive situation and getting to know Marshall and, and John Behe and, and seeing if this place felt like home and, and the little voice in Asher's head said yeah and so he's, he's going to finish up his degree at McMaster and uh, we're excited to work with him for hopefully the next three years. Marshall, I know you had a chance to sit down, go one-on-one -on -one with uh, your fellow quarterback. It's uh, the current quarterback and potentially the next quarterback uh, and roommates as well. Oh, yeah, let's, great cook. <laughs> let's take a look at this interview. Uh, so you came here from Regina. Yeah. You've been on the field for three days now in training camp. Aside from having me as your roommate, what's the biggest thing that you've had to get acquainted to at McMaster and in Hamilton? I would say just the speed of the players so far. Um, everybody out here can play and uh, it's it's really been a challenge but also it's gonna pull my game up to everybody's level um, so the receivers are fast the linebackers are fast uh, the DBs are breaking on every ball um, so that's been a challenge but I'm looking forward to uh, catching up to them and would you say that's the most sizable difference between playing out west and playing here in the OUA against some of the McMaster defensive backs that it's just the speed overall across the board and speed and decision making? It's the speed, but it's also the details. Um, there's lots of details um, in the concepts that we run on offense that Coach Behe and, and Coach Potasiak has, has uh, tried to you know, explain to me. So it's, it's the same system. And I, coming in, I thought, hey, maybe spread is spread, um, but it's really not. And there's so many details on our route combinations and, and, and things that I still need to learn. But um, that's why I'm here, and I'm really enjoying learning more about football. Well, I've got to ask you, Marshall, how did that roommate situation come about? Uh, do you ask him? Yep, I had an a open room at my house that I had signed on with, and uh, I figured I would, I would rather live with someone who's on my schedule and has to go to lifts and meetings and film and everything with me. And uh, I think McMaster quarterbacks tend to have a pretty similar approach to life, as I've learned from Kyle and I being good friends over the last couple of years. So, uh, yeah, I just sent him an email and said, hey, I've got a spot. Do you need anywhere to to settle down and get acquainted your first year and he said yeah so we got together and uh, and figured it out. Did he know going in that he was going to be doing the cooking or was that? Uh... No he actually offered. I was blown away <laughs> like the first day he was there I got a huge stack of eggs and bacon ready for me the first morning so. Wow and he's a good cook. Oh he's fantastic. Yeah. He's a western farm boy maybe? Yeah. I don't know maybe he learned <laughs> on the farm who knows. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, what, what do you think about having uh, two quarterbacks uh, living together? Is that a good situation to have two guys you know that that could potentially be competing for a job you know socializing off the field. Yeah, and I, I think it speaks to that. The friendships are more important, uh, and the competing doesn't mean you don't like each other, and, and uh, we're uh, two quarterbacks and the synergies and, and talking about, did that make sense? Are you getting that read? I don't get that. I don't think that's possible, and just sorting through the nuances of what, what we're trying to do and what we, we can and cannot do, I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful chemistry, and I, I, I'm I'm excited that they're together. They'll hold uh, Coach Quinlan and, and Coach Behe and myself very accountable for what we're trying to do with our quarterbacks this year. Let's talk about the quarterback situation, uh, uh, Don. Obviously, uh, having a veteran guy like Marshall, uh, having to be the guy that's going to have to usher in the next era of quarterback at McMaster University, uh, what do you like uh, about uh, what Marshall's done in the past and what uh, you expect from him this year? Well, I love the continuity from John Behe going from a quarterback on the field to the coaching staff to Kyle Quinlan going from a quarterback on the field to the coaching staff, Marshall uh, going from a quarterback on the field to taking my job in the booth next year. Uh, I love to see that it, it allows Behe to have a comfort level with not only his previous quarterback, but now with his quarterback coach, and him to have a comfort level. With, so it trickled this down, and the, and the knowledge will trickle down, and that continuity becomes vital to the success of the most difficult position in all of sport. So I, I think it bodes very well for the future. And now with having a roommate who may be the next guy, it gives him a decided advantage in competition in 2015 because he's had the benefit of walking back to the house with you and, and talking about, as Steph identified, if we're talking about that coverage or talking about that scheme, or do you think we can really run trips to the field against these guys? Those sorts of conversations can take place. I mean, football is a demanding sport. It's a demanding on you physically and mentally and on your academic life and on your school time. 
So to be able to have those conversations you know, over the breakfast table, I like bacon and eggs, o over the breakfast table about, you know, talking about coverages or, you know, they like to play cover too. How do you recognize that? How do you see that? Those conversations are as much a part of the formal education of football as they are the informal education. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, the relationship uh, with you and, and your other quarterbacks. Uh, I know that uh, when you were a young man uh, just starting in the program, uh, you had somebody like Kyle to look up to and a guy that kind of ushered you into the league. Uh, what did you learn from Kyle and, and what are you bringing to the table when it comes to working with these younger guys? Similar to Kyle's answer about learning things from Coach P, I don't know if I have enough time to talk about what I learned from Kyle. I feel when I look at what I came in as, you know, Coach P in recruiting might have thought that I was, you know, I had a certain skill set, but when I got here, I feel like I was a blank slate because the amount of things I've learned from watching Kyle, I think more than anything else. You know, we talk things through and like we do now with him as my coach, but uh, just the experience of, you know, three years and a bit of, of sitting on the sideline and watching him do things. I'm a pretty visual learner and watching the things he was able to do, it's not so much trying to copy what he did, but there's just things that pop up every game and I feel like mentally I had a little notepad, you know, up in the side of my, my helmet where I was writing things down that he did. So um, I learned a ton from watching him and, and trying to bring, I think the, the thing I want to show those young guys the most, if I can, is just the, the way that you can be a leader and try and you know, every, every football team needs somebody to be vocal at certain points and to step up in moments of need. And um, that's the thing I'm working on right now, trying to be the best I possibly can at and something I want to instill on them so that the, the football program is healthy moving forward when I'm gone. Does it get easier as you get older? Yeah, I think because you understand the process and when to be vocal and when to shut up. And, uh, and uh, it's a healthy balance between all of the different positions on the team. But uh, at certain points, you definitely need your leaders to be your leaders. And, uh, and I'd like to have Asher and Darius understand that when I'm gone. All right, we talked about the offense, we talked about the defense. Let's talk a little bit about special teams and uh, Rob Underhill, your special teams coordinator. What kinds of things are you working on with him? Uh, staying out of his way. He is one of my most organized and uh, 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 in control coaches. Um, he has uh, done a wonderful job uh, building up what Coach Jeffries put in place last year. Um, Coach Jeffrey's uh, biggest strength was kids want to run through a wall for Coach Jeff and he knows them and, and invests in the kids as human beings. Half of his special teams players he's coached throughout the minor leagues and those relationships and wanting to do well for Coach Underhill and his first coordinating experience at the CIS, my guys get it and they want to do it for him and, and so I'm seeing energy and effort from even the, the fifth year guys that think, oh, special teams work, here we go. And they're saying, no, this is Coach Robbie. I want to make sure this goes well. And they're yelling at the young guys to get in line and get it done. So uh, look for a very dynamic group, a group that's looking to make plays and, and letting everything hang out. Uh, having guys like Tyler Capena back uh, to, settle, to settle the forward on special teams helps. And then I think our returners and some of the young guys we brought in, uh, Robbie's going to be a weapon with our special teams and, and they're going to uh, they're going to answer the call when offense and defense is struggling at least once or twice throughout the year. And I know Coach Underhill is another one of those guys you have out in the community doing coaching uh, with the uh, Varsity Hurricanes as well. So he's out doing some recruiting as well. Let's talk about how important special teams is uh, in the OUA. In a league like the OUA, how big are special teams? Any three down football, uh, special teams is huge. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a larger percentage, upwards of 30 or 40 plays a game. Um, and uh, field position is so big. Uh, we talk about managing a football game as a staff and that uh, on offense and defense, controlling the football and not turning it over um, and, and being high percentage is all predicated on being sound on special teams and winning that field position battle. Uh, I think in three down football and especially in CIS where a lot of your coaches are, are glorified volunteers, it's likely to be the one to get neglected first and so to invest in it you do see lots of returns and, and so um, having my best people and my most passionate people there ha I think has been a wise decision. Coach Jeffries last year and Coach Underhill this year, I, I think it's going to win us some football games. All right, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to do some quick final thoughts here, just looking ahead to the season. Don, we'll start with you. What are you expecting from this team this year in 30 seconds or less? Uh, Vanier Cup. Vanier but I think if you go into a MAC football well, season without the third time in the last four years. Yeah, why not? Wow, that, that, I mean, he's putting some the high expectations. And they got the leadership, so they Vanier the, Cup. All right, Kyle, you're an experienced guy. You've been to the Vanier Cup a couple of times. Talk about what you're seeing from this team and maybe some of the things that resemble the teams you played on. 
Well, this is the most fun I've had at a training camp since I've been here. So there's there's weapons all over the field. There's a bunch of young guys that are ready to push their, our vets, and our vets are ready to respond. So uh, I'm pumped. I can't wait. Is it fun because you get to take part in the training with uh, with the other quarterbacks, but you don't have the same pressures that they have? Or that's, that, that's a little part of the that's fun. That's part yeah. of it, yeah. Okay. Uh, Stefan, talk a little bit about what you're expecting uh, from your team. Uh, I mean, you've had eight other teams that you put uh, through a training camp just like this one, and uh, and you've gone uh, to the venue a couple, a couple of times. So, I mean, it's probably tough for you to compare from team to team, but what do you see that's different this year? Uh, just the enthusiasm and, and – uh, uh, the recognition that football is a privilege gives me a hope that we're going to get better week in and week out. If we do get better week in and week out, I think a Yates Cup is a very realistic goal. Uh, and I think that is our primary goal every year. Once you're out of conference, let the chips fall where they may. And sure, let's, let's see if we can go the distance. Um, we got a gap to close with uh, the school down the road in London. Uh, we got 10 weeks to do it, and we got enough horses that it can get done. Marshall, you're looking to go out on a bang. Your last year, what do you like about this team? Uh, just the, the willingness to learn and adapt to a system and want to be a part of something special. I think that's a theme that was uh, definitely there in 2011, 2012, and I, I hope to see a return of that kind of enthusiasm this year. All right, well, Cable 14, once again, this year is the place to be when it comes to uh, McMaster Marauders football. We've got four games for you. All four home games from Ron Joyce Stadium will be on Cable 14. Let's just roll through those games. And, of course, we talked about the big Labor Day matchup, the season opener against the Guelph Griffins. That's coming up Monday, September the 1st. And then uh, our next game against the Ravens on Saturday, September the 13th uh, at Ron Joyce Stadium. Again, coverage getting underway at 1 uh, p.m. Then we're back on the air against Queens, another big game. That one coming up on uh, the 27th of October and then of course uh, you guys will finish off the season uh, as well uh, at home uh, I, we, I don't have the graphic there against Laurier that's right uh, so Laurier uh, coming up as well all of those games on cable 14 and of course uh, this has been the 2014 McMaster Marauders football preview show thank you for watching and guys thanks for taking part in this